Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful friends and loyal listeners. It's always such a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you so much for listening and interacting with me on social media. That truly it does make it all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. And remember that we're now live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m., YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern. And of course, all episodes of A Moment of Zen are now streaming 24-7 on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV. We have such a great show lined up for you today. Very exciting stuff in our Millennial Mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com. We're featuring the amazing Kirsten Chernek, a dedicated wife of 14 years to Thomas and a mother to Mia, Kai, and Aria. They adopted biological siblings, Mia and Kai, from foster care, and their youngest daughter, Aria, now has Down syndrome. They are currently in the process of adopting another baby with Down syndrome. Today, we're chatting disability awareness, Down syndrome advocacy, and demystifying the stigmas. In our Travel Treasure segment, brought to you by Navi, we're featuring Unique International, luxury travel host, four-time platinum recording artist and influencer with over 2.9 million followers. Today is his third time on our show, and he's here to chat music, life on the road, his plans for 2023, and a true story. What incident almost took his life? In our Hello Open Metaverse segment brought to you by Animoca Brands, this week we're featuring Mohamed Azeldin, head of tokenomics at Animoca. He's joined by Amanda Slavin, co-founder of Catalyst Creative, and also author of The Seventh Level. They are joined by Anthony Day, keynote speaker, top LinkedIn voice, blockchain enthusiast, and Web3 expert. He's also the host of the Blockchain Won't Save the World podcast. Today, we're chatting all about education surrounding Web3, the basics to keep in mind using the blockchain, and the most important use cases. In our business and buzz segment, brought to you by Revere Securities, we're featuring Sal Buscemi, CEO and co-founding partner of HRN, a private multi-family investment office and CEO for Danju Partners Capital Management. Impressively, Sal is also the author of several books on investing. His most recent work, Legacy Investing, How the 0.001% Invest, reveals the concerns, passions, and prejudices of the world's wealthiest families and how that influences their investment decision-making. Today, we're chatting generational wealth, leaving a legacy, and investing with a purpose. Please stay tuned. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back with Unique International. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes, we have our Travel Treasure segment brought to you by Navi. And today we're featuring Unique International, a luxury travel host, a four-time platinum recording artist and influencer with over 2.9 million followers. Now, while the live music industry is back up and running and artists can finally get back on the road, Road, the novelty of touring can be short-lived. A tour always starts out with the excitable sense of adventure, escaping the confines of normal life to go on a notable voyage. But as it drags on and the routine of reality sinks in and touring begins to dull the shine of those innocent first two weeks, it can all start to feel isolating and rather quickly. Today is Unique's third time on our show. He's here to chat music, life on the road, his plans for 2023, and what it's like being a music recording artist. Welcome to the show, superstar. What's up? <laughs> Welcome back. Man, I'm, it's good to be back. <laughs> Congrats I, on all your success. Thank you. 
all the followers that you have. And now tell me, you have close to 3 million followers here, but making it in the music industry is tough enough, but you've also amassed your own fan base in our social media sensation. How did you get started? I got started when I was seven years old. Um, I met Michael Jackson. I actually met him on stage and Rolling Stones. I was the little black kid throwing out uh, memorabilia of whatever they were promoting at the time. And so I've been in the industry since I was seven. And how do you keep your followers following you and so committed? For one, I don't post all the time. For two, when I post, it makes sense. I'm going to post something that you're going to think about. And why did I do that? Tell me. <laughs> well, the biggest thing is what I learned in this industry is a lot of people post a lot of the same thing over and over. And if you learn how to post things that people want, or they might have it already, but in a certain pose or a certain video, then it will attract people to come to your posts more. I love it. So you're very calculated, very well, very well thought out here. You don't just post for no reason. You post for purpose, for a meaning and with yeah. a specific target. Now, I know that you battled uh, a little bit of a health scare not long ago. How is your health now? I know that you faced some scary moments. I want you to tell me what happened and how did it set back your career or set, yeah. set it forward? Yeah. OK, so starting off with how it set me back, uh, I had to fight it for two and a half years. Fight uh, what? Fight uh, pneumonia. And uh, it was a hard fight. It was almost beating me. But I kept a strong will. And it just like, I made it through. It was so many pills every day. Like I was eating, I was eating pills and tasting pills as I'm eating or drinking. Because it, it was antibiotics and all kind of extra stuff. And then at the end of the day, when I finally beat it, I felt relieved, but I lost a lot of money at the same time and a lot of properties because I had to pay for medical bills. Um, my career took a kind of a halt because I couldn't sing at all. I had no voice for about a year and a half. So all I could do is rap. And I mean, rapping is cool, but I had to do something. So as I was sick, I still stayed in my studio and I still created but I just couldn't go nowhere because I couldn't be around people. So the setback is I couldn't go on tour at all. Uh, uh, but now, but now you can. So yeah. what is life like on the road? I mean, describe the contrast between being on stage and having that intense communion between performer and audience and traveling between cities on a dark, empty motorway, so to speak, silently making your way to the next gig. Um, so when it comes to traveling, I'm not like a normal artist per se. Um, I'm an artist that is an influencer. I've been a brand ambassador for now 10 years. So when I do shows, they're not shows like performing. I could choose to do that or I represent a brand. The brand that I represent, I make sure that I let them know that I'm representing them. They take care of my travel. They take care of my hotels, wherever I go, you know. I mess with a lot of people in Florida, a lot of people overseas. Like I'm heading actually now to Egypt because we have a travel club called Click Travel Club. And it's a, a company with thick media. And that's actually my girl. <laughs> and uh, we worked it out together and we created this travel club and we're bringing like influencers with us to see the light of the funness that they're missing in life. And like, get paid. And get paid, yeah. Or get, get some paid. free perks. Yeah, plus the the artists or the influencers or whoever's coming along, they get to not pay nothing. All they got to do is pay their little fee and to uh, get a plane ticket, and that's it. And then they get to have the fun with us. You know what's so interesting? You know, we're talking about the music industry, life on the road, touring. Here I am saying, what's life like on the road? And here you're telling me, what? There's no life on the road. I get flown everywhere, luxury, private jets, penthouses, the best yeah. locations of the world. And that's the truth. The truth is, is that social media has propelled this industry and in where now you can leverage your fan base, your community, make money yeah. from this. This is fantastic. It's, you know, this is the way that, 
this generation is making money to to everyone's point there's yeah. gold in them digital hills because now you have this array of followers that you have 2.9 million and who, who needs a record deal you got your own deal you know how many record deals come at me a day and then i figure out what's funny is i'll get signed and then they'll ask me questions on what what i can do for them and their business but here's the thing it's like it doesn't make sense because i literally want to sign with the label because of who they are and what they could do for me. And then I find out that I am have more that I could do for them than they could do for me. It's true. So, you are the value in the equation and don't you forget that. So um, when you typically travel and go uh, either to perform, so we're going to change the word from being on tour to your bookings. When you get yeah. booked to perform around the world, different locations, how long are you gone for out of time? Do you make a vacation out of it? And also yeah. what's your favorite place in the world that you've traveled to so far? Um, usually gone about half a month. When I, when I leave, I'm gone. I love Chicago. You know, I'm Chicago big time. Um, I go back and forth, Portland, Chicago, um, Atlanta, I have houses there and then uh, New York, you know what I'm saying? Boston. I actually like Boston. I got friends out there, so I go there. <laughs> um, India. India is one of my biggest fan base. I've done shows there. I have stayed there for six months. It is beautiful and the food is amazing. Now, this new adventure is, you know, Thailand, Hong Kong. And then I'm before that, I'm going to uh, Egypt, you know, and Paris. Paris is going to be fun. So for me, I still have not figured out which one, which country is the best place. Because they're, they all offer something amazing. Yeah, it's, it's yet to be seen. And, and the road will uncover that. And you're going to go where yeah. there is no path. And you're going to leave that trail, my dear friend, because that's what you do. You have a fire in, in you and you have a drive that's unlike any other. Now, what is your diva travel request? We have about two minutes. I have a few more questions, but diva okay. travel request. Come on, we all have one. <laughs> I like to be five stars, period. Love I don't it. Like, I don't okay. like to go anywhere that's not five stars. I, I like to be in the high rise. A lot. Okay, good. High rise, five stars. Okay, yeah. uh, three top travel tips that you have for the average person. Know what you want to do. Have a travel agency that cares about you buy the right plane tickets because you'll be comfortable or not comfortable love that staying healthy on the road quick tips yeah stay healthy don't eat uh, a whole bunch of meat on the road because it actually starts to mess with you meat on the road messes with you very good tips because yeah. you, you don't know how it's been cooked if it's fresh that's that's yeah. great tips um yeah. all right and lastly balancing relationships i know that it's hard as a recording artist i know that you're an influencer you're always on the road i know that you shouted out your girl not long ago now we don't know if that's the romantic girl or if that's your business partner but i will say that you probably have some wise advice here what do you have yeah um the biggest thing is, is uh, when it comes to being in this industry and being with someone, you can't really talk a lot about it because people get too much in your business. But I'll say that she's a great business partner. She owns a, a magazine called Thick Media, and she's been doing so much for me. She's a publicist. So, of course, I'm going to talk about someone that is a great person. She's just a great individual. All around so, good soul. Well, and, and yeah. it's important to surround yourself with good individuals that get your vibe, that yeah. want to reciprocate, that want to add to your ecosystem, that can offer synergistic relationships, and that won't wear you down or tear you down. So it sounds like you, you're you on the right track with those friendships and relationships, and we wish you all the best. We are Thank out of time, my dear friend. Thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure. No problem. No problem. I can't wait to see what y'all do next. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. We're definitely going to keep an eye out for you. Guys, you definitely have to check out Unique. Check them out, Unique International, on the gram at Unique INT's World. You can also check the hashtag, hashtag Unique INT. Definitely don't want to miss out all his cool posts, music, digital creation, travel influencer. He's all of the above, but more importantly, he's a really good soul. That was our travel treasure segment brought to you by Navi. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. That was Unique International, luxury travel host, four-time platinum recording artist. We'll be right back after this.
A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OG Pay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OG Pay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our Millennial Mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com, we're featuring the amazing Kirsten Chernek, a dedicated wife of 14 years to Thomas and a mom to Mia, Kai, and Aria. They adopted biological siblings, Mia and Kai, from foster care, and their youngest daughter, Aria, has Down syndrome. They're currently in the process of adopting another baby with Down syndrome and are looking forward to growing their beautiful family. Kirsten loves advocating for adoption, foster care, and Down syndrome awareness through her community and her social media, which is where I found her. Now, let's review. People with Down syndrome have an extra chromosome. The nucleus of a typical cell contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 total. Each of these chromosomes determines something about you, from your hair color to your sex to all those little details. People with Down syndrome have an extra copy or what we call a partial copy of chromosome 21. Each year, about 6,000 babies are born with Down syndrome in the United States, and the numbers are escalating. It's the most common chromosomal disorder in America. Today, we're chatting disability awareness, Down syndrome advocacy, and demystifying the stigmas. Welcome to the show, Stunner. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming on. I mean, it's fantastic. I love your social media page. Your kids are absolutely beautiful. Thank and you. you are like, you're going to get the mom of the year award. Oh, thank you. That is so kind. I really appreciate it. I definitely love being a mom. It's my greatest honor. Well, talk to me about what that actually is and feels like uh, in your situation. So clearly you found out about Down syndrome in, in probably a natal screening and decided yeah. to keep your baby. Talk to me about this decision and what was that like? Yeah, so I actually had a great experience in terms of when I was told about Aria's diagnosis and her having Down syndrome, um, my OB was phenomenal and was actually really encouraging to me. He did say like, you know, this is going to make life a little bit harder and there are going to be some things that you're going to have to overcome with her. Um, but he was amazing in how he presented the information to me. Um, for us, um, not keeping her was not an option. We absolutely knew um, that we wanted to have her and it took time to process for sure. I did not know a ton about Down syndrome, so I wasn't super educated, but it was one of those things that the more I started to research and find out about and hear from people's experiences, the better I felt about it. And by the time she was born, I just knew she was always supposed to be the one for me. It's such a beautiful story. And she looks exactly like you, by the way. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. That beautiful little lot. girl. Beautiful thank little you. girl. Really, truly. Now, how are the other children adjusting to Aria? And what made you decide to adopt a third child? But this time, specifically, you want to adopt a child with Down syndrome. Talk to me about that. Yeah. So that was probably my greatest apprehension when I got her diagnosis was how it was going to affect Mia and Kai. Um and I, the second I brought her home and they were playing and interacting with her, it just, all of those fears melt away. I just saw how much they loved her, how much they didn't even see a diagnosis, even though we tried to explain it to them at the time, they were three and two years old. And so um, now seeing who they are together, like the three of them, they were always meant to be. Mia and Kai are phenomenal with her. She is so great with them. She looks up to them. They are her role models. And she just allows them to have so much fun and just like bring so much silliness and joy to our lives. And so they get to experience that on a daily basis. And so in terms of adoption and our family growing, moving forward. So like you mentioned, we adopted Mia and Kai. That is how we decided to start our family. We adopted them from foster care. Then we had this amazing experience with having this beautiful child with Down syndrome opening our eyes to this amazing, phenomenal community that we just weren't aware of before. 
And when we were thinking and praying about, you know, continuing to grow our family, we just started having the conversation of what would it look like to adopt a child with Down syndrome? And so I started doing some research and found out there's actually an organization specific to that here in the States. It's called the National Down Syndrome Adoptive Network. And they handle all of the adoptions when you're adopting a child from Down syndrome and pairing parents or a mom who has a Down syndrome diagnosis with their baby and they match that. And so um, we started our home study and um, started the process and became a waiting family with them about a year ago. So we are excited. Um, We're trusting in the timing and we're looking forward to it. I love it. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Now Aria is going to have a soul sister or a soul brother, boy or girl. So yeah, we actually are adopting specifically a girl because we imagine as they get older, Aria and her will, you know, probably live together and it'll just make things less complicated in our family dynamics. So adopting a girl with Down syndrome. Yeah. Very well thought out, Kirsten. (laughs) Very well thought out. If I was your mom, I'd say I'm so proud of you. (laughs) Thank you. No. It's true. Now let's go back. Um, Down syndrome affects everyone a little bit differently. How does Down syndrome affect specifically Aria's health and development? Yeah. So we have definitely had some developmental delays specifically when it comes to speech for her. So fine motor skills, um, physical therapy, that type of thing. She has always come very easily to her. Um, she kind of hit all those targets um, appropriately, but speech has been our major delay. So actually, as of yesterday, we had a communication device delivered um, that she is going to use and that's going to help her communicate with us. It kind of looks like an iPad, has an app that helps her. She selects pictures and it says the words for her and her hearing those words over and over again will help her familiarize with them. And so that has been our her specific area that we've worked on the most. And honestly, it's been a really cool experience to learn how to communicate, have her learn communication with a child who is nonverbal and just realize how much we communicate beyond words. And it's honestly been a beautiful process like I, something that I didn't expect so I'm definitely excited for the day that she is robo but I have learned a lot in this season with her as we've been navigating these speech delays um the only other thing has been you know she has a lower immune system and so we have had to put some extra precautions into place with just like sicknesses that come and go um and so outside of that though she is so healthy she is so strong she is the most confident little girl you will ever meet she walks into a room and people know she's there she just really has a strong a beautiful presence and so it's been wonderful to be her mom oh well her presence comes through on social media i follow your page (laughs) i love her i love her and i love you and i love your family now What's the best way, if you could give advice, uh, the best way to encourage others who have a new diagnosis to Down syndrome? Yeah, I would say definitely have a lot of grace for yourself in the process of, you know, as you're navigating, accepting this diagnosis for your child. It's hard. I I grieved. Once I found out Aria's diagnosis, I had had one picture of what my child was going to be like. And when I got her diagnosis, in a sense, it felt like, okay, that child has died and now this is a new one. And there was grief associated with that. And so I tell parents like, give yourself so much grace, feel the things. But I will tell you, once they place that child in your arms, all of that is going to fade away. You will see that child for who they are, not their diagnosis. And you will begin the most beautiful journey of just the most magical, unfiltered love. Like that is what people with Down syndrome have to offer. And there's so few of us that get to experience that. So you truly, when you get a child with Down syndrome, you win the lottery. And again, it takes some time to accept that, but that is the reality. And so every day we wake up and we feel like we won the lottery with her. And so I would just encourage parents to know that they won the lottery and, and to enjoy every second. And so enjoy it. Well, yeah. you know, I, my question was, what, what what was has this journey taught you? But clearly, you won the lottery, so oh. it taught you it taught you everything. Yeah, yeah, it has. It's now, what me. has been the hardest part? What's what's? I mean, it's not what you envisioned, yeah. right? But what yeah. is the hardest part? 
The hardest part is her medical complexities. She had open heart surgery when she was eight months old. She went into active heart failure four months prior to that. So we were in and out of hospitals. Um, the developmental delays, it doesn't impact or affect me. I've had pretty good laser focus when it comes to her. I don't compare her to other children, their milestones, what they're doing. I really just truly keep my eyes fixed on her and compare her to her. And so um, medical complexities has definitely been one of the harder things that we've had to navigate, as well as the education system. So I know you follow me on social media. I've been sharing a lot about that. Um, and where we live currently, they don't necessarily practice inclusion in the classroom for kids with disabilities. And so we have been clawing and fighting our way through the system um, and have found a way for her to be in a class with typical peers where we believe she will learn so much, um, but also they will. They're gonna learn a lot about going to school with a child that is slightly different from them and everything that she has to teach them. So those are the things that we're currently navigating and have been more difficult, but also empowering as her mom of, okay, I get to do this for her. And I believe I am competent enough to be able to pave a way for not only her, but other kids that come after her. Yeah, wow. I mean, listen, you have such a such a positive uh, healthy and balanced outlook that, that I think that's key. It's, it's your outlook. It's your perception, right? Perception is reality. And the way that you're navigating these emotions and applying logic to reason and, and, and truly balancing it all out, not just what's best for you, but what's best for your family and your ecosystem and the siblings. That's so important because it's one thing to be a mom and to have it all together. And it's another thing to be a mom, to be wise, to be competent, to be educated, to be selfless and to really do your research. Because I think that's, that's what it comes down to. You're educated in these areas. You know what the, what the downfalls are and you know what the upside is, but you're so honest with your emotions. And you give me so when I read your posts mm -hmm. and I look at, you know, what your life is, which is an amazing, beautiful life that you work hard to get. I, feel the boost as a mom to see your joy as mom come through your your social media so it's great thank you that really means a lot to me i appreciate you saying that absolutely now last question <laughs> what is the biggest misconception about down syndrome oh the limits that people place on them as to what they're able to do um we've grown so much in this area specifically over the last 30 years but you have to remember 30 years ago kids with down syndrome were institutionalized and so we have come very far as a society, but we also have so far to go. Um, kids with Down syndrome are constantly just lifting the ceiling in terms of what they're able to do and proving that over and over again. And we as a society are just realizing we just give them the opportunity to do so. We need to give them the opportunity to prove it to us. And so my job as Aria's mom is to give her as many of those opportunities as I can um, and hold her hand through that journey, but also know she's completely capable. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's how it's been for us. I love it. Well, listen, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure chatting yeah. with you. And more importantly, thank you for everything that you're doing to really get the message out there about Down syndrome and being so transparent with your family. It goes a long way. Thank you, Zen. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. That was the amazing Kirsten Chernek. You definitely have to check her out on the gram. She goes by at Kirsten Chernek, spelled K-I-R-S-T-I-N-C-Z-E-R-N-E-K. That was our millennial mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Animoca Brands. As a worldwide industry leader in digital entertainment, blockchain, and digital property rights, Animoca Brands plays a key role in the future growth of the open metaverse. During unstable times like these in burgeoning industries similar to blockchain, it's important to realize that blockchain can and will survive and eventually flourish and industry-leading companies like Animoca Brands will guide the transformation into the future. Animoca Brands will keep building a better and fairer Web3 ecosystem, create impact for better, and bring true digital property rights to all internet users through NFTs and the open metaverse. For more information and to become part of the excitement, go to animocabrands.com. That's animocabrands.com.
Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Coming up in just a few moments in our Hello Open Metaverse, brought to you by Animoca Brands, we're featuring the awesome Mohammed Azeldin. Mo heads up the tokenomics team at Animoca Brands, a leader in digital entertainment, blockchain, and gamification that's working to advance digital property rights and contribute to the establishment of the open metaverse. Today, he's joined by his good friend, Amanda Slavin, co-founder of Catalyst Creative and author of The Seventh Level. She's been recognized as Forbes 30 Under 30 for marketing and advertising. Today, she's joined by Anthony Day, whose career spans over 20 years in tech and innovation with the likes of Monitor, Deloitte, IBM, and Polkadot. He's also the host of the Blockchain Won't Save the World podcast, bringing hype-free objective analysis into the history and trajectory of blockchain and Web3. Today, we're chatting all about education surrounding Web3.0, the basics to keep in mind using the blockchain and its most important use cases. Welcome to the show, my friends. Thank you so much hey, for the kind invitation. Great to be back. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mo, I'll start with you. I see uh, when you look at the broader picture here, I kind of feel and see you and Animoca as accelerators of sorts. Put simply, an accelerator is an organization that helps existing companies grow and develop. Their team typically often includes experts from a variety of backgrounds. And when you talk about it in a Web3 context, this often includes those with a deep understanding of tokenomics, metaverse, and how best to match a project's idea to the needs of of the ever-changing Web3 market. And above all, Mo, project heads like yourself need tons of mental fortitude, coachability, and execution-focused mindset. Why is education a top priority at Animoca Brands, and what fundamentals are you aiming to teach? I guess education is at the forefront of, of everything, like the foundation of everything that we do. And for us to be able to move forward as an industry, we, we need to have a solid foundation for that so with with that in mind we talk about different buzzwords within the spaces as, as low-hanging fruit they have different meanings to different people even within our own industry and, and within our own enterprise and, and portfolios from that aspect so education from that side of things is super important so we can move forward as one and also we talk about mainstream adoption we want mass adoption to come in we want users to come in if we can't agree on what some of these terms mean how can we then expect people outside looking in to agree that actually this is a good space. So from the, that's one side of things. The other side of things, education in a more historical sense, we've seen that we've been held back, especially that the rise in technology in the past 20 years, as human beings, we're only starting to see the knock-on effects of how our interaction with technology and what we're, what we're being taught in schools and, and universities, there is a big disparity between both. So the rise of, of blockchain technology can actually help close that, 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 that massive gap that's there, but it's on industry leaders like ourselves to help fortify that space. Exactly. And knowing this, we can trust that data is extremely important because that's the bottom line here. This is why I think blockchain especially is so important and educating the community to your point, especially the next generation is going to be the cornerstone for all of us because education continues to be a major touch point in the Web3 space with many brands and initiatives focusing on educating users alongside the technological development. So what you're doing is great. Anthony, welcome back. Thank you so much, Zan. It's great to be back. Absolutely. So let's let's dive right in here. So Web3 will also make use of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this is, of course, going to help empower more intelligent trends and adaptive applications. But really, Web3 embraces decentralization. We've been talking about this uh, from the onset, and it's being built, operated, and owned by its actual users, which is quite proprietary here versus Web2. But when you look at Web3, it also uses, of course, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and NFTs to give power back to the users in the form of ownership, of course, in this next stage of innovation with this internet and where we're heading. Talk to me about how Web3 specifically can scale, can scale one's business if you're looking at it from a business perspective. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Zen. So with scalability and Web3, you talk about 
public blockchains, you talk about open standards, open source code. There's a whole bunch of reasons why that's important. Open source allows anybody to interpret the code that you're using to be able to build on top of that code or to fork that code and create different things. So open and transparent makes things very easy to build on top of. So rather than creating or trying to re-engineer things that existed before, you can build and, and kind of progress from work that's already been done. So we're allowed to move faster. I think that's a really important part. Also, when you have open economies, token economies, open data platforms, and so on, anyone can participate. Anyone can host a node. Anyone can contribute a transaction. And so building a community becomes much easier to do because there are no barriers to entry. Or the barriers to entry, at least, are, are lower and easier. And also, at the same time, with the, I would say, gig economy, also the open source economy, it's easier for individuals, founders, small projects to start contributing code or contributing to Web3 in general. So the barriers it doesn't have to be a nine to five. You don't have to join a large enterprise to be part of this industry. You can be a sole developer. You can be a small team. You can be a giant team if you like. But the barriers for contributing code or contributing to, to this community or this economy is much, much lower than some other areas. I love it. It's truly the rise of the creator economy. It's very well put. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So let's take, get your perspective here. So in Web 3.0, of course, we know blockchain will exercise this peer-to-peer -peer technology principles, P2P, what we call. Web 3 is decentralized. And of course, instead of large swaths of the internet, to Anthony's point, controlled and owned by centralized entities, ownership gets distributed amongst its builders and users. This is core. It often requires enormous amounts of energy to operate a blockchain. And this has been one of the most justifiably, of course, significant hurdles to the technology is widespread adoption. But we're increasingly seeing Web3 companies really emphasize eco-awareness in their business models. Talk to me, in your point of view, what will be the top blockchain trends for 2023? And what do you say to the car carbon footprint these transactions are leaving behind? Well, I and I, you know, this wasn't in the bio, but I, I'm a teacher. I have a master's in education, and my background is actually focused on engagement. Uh, and I applied these levels of engagement, these seven levels of engagement, into everything that I've done throughout my entire career. And when when it comes to Web three, there's this huge opportunity around being able to really reach these higher levels of engagement, the level six and the level seven. Six, inspiring people to set goals to make a difference, and seventh level, literate thinking when personal values and beliefs align. But with the carbon footprint problem, it's standing in the way of being able to have these larger initiatives take place and for individuals to be able to see the really positive impacts when it comes to the blockchain. So I think what, what Mo was saying before is that there are huge barriers. Forget about just the carbon footprint, which is a huge barrier. The biggest barrier, I think, is the limitations in the way that we're communicating about Web3 and about the blockchain, about the technological implications of these initiatives, because people have no idea what we're talking about. And so we have to stop using acronyms. We have to stop describing things with the technology. So an NFT is actually describing what it is, not actually, and what it does, not giving it a name that is easy to understand, easy to digest. So if we're going to do anything when it comes to Web3, I think we're going to stop talking about it as Web3. We're going, it's going to become an invisible layer as a part of everything that we're doing. And it's going to be starting to be embodied by the people that don't understand it in a way that's streamlined and then communicated in that fashion so that the, the actual public can start to adopt it versus just a, still a small subset of people. That's so well time. said. So well said. Well, of <laughs> course you're a teacher, and there you have it. Thanks for that, Amanda. That was that was a great recap. Um, Mo, I'll, I'll come back to you on this one. When you look at the grand grand scheme of things, all new human inventions in our civilization tend to follow one basic rule: the innovations that increase convenience will eventually become king. We've seen this with cars versus horses, with credit cards versus cash, and computers versus paper record. How will Web3 facilitate things? How is this more convenient for the user? Uh, you know, when you ask this from the broader perspective, why can't we do this using existing non-blockchain, non-metaverse systems? And will this save money? I know you have a lot to unpack, but you're really good at what you do. <laughs> So uh, it helps being a teacher or having had been a teacher in a previous life as well. So I think that the main difference is that Web3 isn't for convenience. It's more for digital ownership. And there has to be a shift in mentality because we understand physical ownership. I own my house, I own my car, I own my phone. But we don't really understand the value of owning our digital assets or even our data to, to begin with. Um, whenever I'm on stage, I always ask the question, how many of us have heard about Facebook 
buying out WhatsApp a few years back, a lot of hands go up. How many of us were downloading Signal and Telegram because we were afraid of our data? A lot of hands go up. How many of us still use WhatsApp? Everyone's hand still goes up. So it shows that we understand or we think we understand the problem, but clearly we don't because we're still using platforms where we know our data isn't safe. And that's one layer of it. So for me, it's not as much about how it can make things more convenient, but how it can give us back ownership, where it is genuine an ownership economy of our data, of our digital assets. And then to your point, NFTs, was an NFT, it was a PFP, it might be an in-game asset, but we're starting to see so many different variations and use cases for how we can use NFTs. And for anyone out there listening, again, it's like, well, that doesn't actually answer the question. Think of an NFT as a digital container and you can put anything inside that you want. And another big part of why we've seen limitations to adoption of the technology is the technology is still very nascent considering what 12 or 13 years ago we had Bitcoin and up and fast forward until today, you've got a lot of big brands who are now dipping their toes. Um, if it's Nike, if it's Adidas, if it's Ubisoft, if it's a lot of the big central banks. So we're starting to see adoption take place, but there are still limitations in terms of what's happening on the back end and how we're portraying that to the front end. And that's where there's a big difference between crypto and Web3. But I'll, I'll pause there. I love it. I love it. Okay, well, we have two minutes left. I want to get Anthony's question, then I'll come back to Amanda. But uh, Anthony, ultimately, what we ask is that people look beyond what we've been saying now, these buzzwords, right? Amanda made a, brought up a great point, these buzzwords, and consider what will drive mass adoption based on convenience and present-day value. If you look at the demographics, right, we have Gen Z. They want NFT-based loyalty, so planning for that will help to endear businesses to the next generation. And while Decentraland may, by some estimates, have less than a thousand daily active users, okay, how many kids these days are logging into the Roblox servers to play and collaborate on virtual world creations? Hint, it's in the millions. So thinking broader, blockchain will eventually to everyone's point here, change everything. And it is something that we must explore uh, and address on, on a more visionary roadmap. But all the implementations must be framed not in terms of what the current hype is, in my opinion, but in terms of the fundamentals of how this can disrupt technocracy and really put power back to the people. It's all about data sovereignty. Anthony, what is the necessary catalyst, in your opinion, to start the next crypto bull market and is mass adoption truly in the horizon? So I think I don't think of it in terms of crypto and and market caps as such. Coin prices or the coin prices for respective layer ones and twos are analogous to high growth tech stocks. That's the appreciation or the valuation of how much activity or how much potential sits in those in those particular platforms. If you look at the developer activity on particular platforms, that's super important. If you look at the number of applications being built on those platforms, it's super important. Blockchain itself is not going to save the world. Right. I've said that before. It's about people using technology to transform the way they do things, to change the jobs that they're already doing or to create businesses that may be better. Do more, do better, do different. How do we do that? We put the technology into the hands of more people. We help more people understand the implications of decentralized technology and how it can work in a language they understand. And we give them in my view, the next big horizon is low code or no code tooling that allows non web three core developers to be able to work with decentralized technology so that an enterprise developer, a startup developer, a student doesn't have to necessarily learn solidity or rust. They can imagine an application that makes use of a decentralized community or that makes the use of tokens or makes use of its own um, cryptographic economy and is then able to do whatever that is in verticals like gaming or finance or social media or any other space. I think accessibility of the technology is going to be critically important. And then it's about the people doing things with it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for that very elaborate, um, you know, uh, uh, answer to my question. It's, it's exactly where, where I was going with it because I, I wanted you to say it, right? It's in the sense where now we're listening, we're, we're listening to all the education come around for, for the technology surrounding Web3 and blockchain, but you are an expert in your field. You know, Mo does what he does because he's the head of tokenomics at Animoca and Amanda is the business person she is because she studies this and this is what you, this is your, this is your world. But from an outsider's perspective, who's just looking at this unfold, it's refreshing to know that we do have leaders in the society like yourselves who are the pillars of the education. So thank you. Much appreciated. Again, like Amanda said, we have so often 
mistitled or incorrectly addressed the community. We've so often gone out with explaining how blockchains and cryptocurrencies or cryptography works rather than the implications of what they do. Um, and, and the engineers rightly title things in the same way as explorers named towns, mountains, and islands after themselves. The engineers who created incredible technology came out with terminology that at the time they wanted to use to describe the stuff we have. Okay. That hasn't <laughs> been easy for, yeah. for regular human beings to follow on and pick up. So we've got Without some work to do. Well, listen, we are out of time, my dear friends. Don't move a muscle. We'll be right back after this. And I just want to thank all of you for coming on and, and chatting blockchain education and where we're headed. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. That was our Hello Open Metaverse segment brought to you by Animoca Brands. Do check out Anthony Day on LinkedIn at Anthony JJ Day. Check out Amanda Slavin, co-founder at Catalyst Creative and author of The Seventh Level. And definitely check out Mohammed Azeldin, head of tokenomics at AnimocaBrands.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Animoca Brands. As a worldwide industry leader in digital entertainment, blockchain, and digital property rights, Animoca Brands plays a key role in the future growth of the open metaverse. During unstable times like these in burgeoning industries similar to blockchain, it's important to realize that blockchain can and will survive and eventually flourish and industry-leading companies like Animoca Brands will guide the transformation into the future. Animoca Brands will keep building a better and fairer Web3 ecosystem, create impact for better, and bring true digital property rights to all internet users through NFTs and the open metaverse. For more information and to become part of the excitement, go to animocabrands.com. That's animocabrands.com. Welcome back, my dear friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. Welcoming back to our Hello Open Metaverse segment brought to you by Animoca Brands. We're chatting with the amazing Amanda Slavin, co-founder at Catalyst Creative and author of The Seventh Level, Mohammed Azeldin, head of tokenomics at Animoca Brands, and Anthony Day blockchain expert and a podcast host. Welcome back to the show, my friends. Thanks. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Excited. <laughs> Excited to have you on. Okay, yeah. so let's chat. Uh, we, we've been talking about blockchain, blockchain technology, where we're headed, uh, the education involving this industry. Uh, let's chat mindset. Okay, so a new survey from CoinWire, which surveyed over 10,000 investors in the crypto space back in December of 2022, found that user sentiment towards the metaverse has digital reality poised to influence all areas of social life. We have 69% of percent of respondents that have placed their bet on the metaverse to re reshape social lifestyle with this new approach to entertainment. We have 65% they believe in metaverse's new approach to show social activities. So sentiments on how it will affect finances, business, and education are also extremely high at close to 62%. These numbers speak volumes because over the last five years, if you look, Microsoft secured 158 metaverse related patents, which overshadowed big tech firms such as Meta and Tencent and Epic Games. What do you say to all of this motion and what does this really signal in our industry? I think that teachers were not a part of that survey. Uh, <laughs> that would be my first thing. Um, I think that we have, you know, New York City Department of Education, this is not technically Web3, but it is a new innovative technology ban ChatGPT from schools. And that was a really big uproar in the technological community because people didn't understand it. They said, New York City Department of Education said that the, it doesn't teach critical thinking. I'm going to go back to that whole concept around that NFT is a non-fungible token. It's describing the technological implications of it. ChatGPT is a tool. It should not be actually teaching critical thinking. We're too obsessed with the outcome and the assessments of how we are thinking about critical thinking versus actually changing the way that we're teaching critical thinking. So in order for the metaverse to have true adoption in education systems, we need to work with educators. We need to ask educators how, same thing what Anthony said, First of all, we need to change the language that it's inviting to, ed to educators and say, this is what it means for you. This is what it looks like. For you. This is how it could support you. This is how it could guide you. Then we have to teach them those skills to make their lives easier, not harder. They already have so much that they're, that they're working against in our education system. And so we can't just say, here's a new flashy thing over here that's going to completely make your life harder because there's no adoption within the classroom. Or here's a new flashy thing over here that's going to take away from your actual, the work that you're doing. It has to be integrative. And so I do feel that that the metaverse, the metaverse, blockchain, you know, 
interoperability in terms of the classroom and digital learning. And just imagine how groundbreaking that's going to be. The metaverse and reality and children being able to have that tie, that connection. There's so many opportunities, but before we keep talking to teachers, we have to ask teachers and listen and then work with them to create the new realities. Like Mo, you know, that's Mo and I connected because we were both educators. Now we're in this space and, and education is everywhere. And we have to understand that. And we have to then again, really listen before we keep talking. I love it because once you're educated, then you don't fear uh, the unknown because you're you're completely aware of you know the the steps involved in in these this entire ecosystem when we're talking about Web three. So total understanding uh, the trajectory of what these terminologies mean, applying them to your business, applying them to your own individual you know lifestyle as we're headed into this next you know. Um, the next phase of the internet is extremely important. You said it, you hit it right on. Um, all right, so now we have a group question. I want to kind of do a discussion here. So, um, well, you know, if you if if you guys want to answer the question, uh, we'll go back to Anthony first, we'll go to Mo, and then Amanda, you can answer lastly. So in line with, with the uncertainty that many investors are feeling, uh, back to statistics, because statistics don't lie, more than 60% said they want more regulations applied to the industry. Of course, we all do. That's part of the problem. And over the last year, regulators across the globe began to adopt and discuss new rules for the industry. Nonetheless, areas of Web3, like the metaverse, remain high on the priority list for many countries. Recently, we have South Korean government. They opened up its pilot metaverse city to the public. And a report from McKinsey forecasted that, forecasted that the metaverse will generate $5 trillion in value in the next seven years. $5 trillion. That's, that's a big number. Uh, Anthony, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on this? Is it overhyped? Um, get in while you can start to educate yourself. What does this all mean? So if you look at the metaverse, I think there's a huge amount of potential for this being an, another domain or another horizon of activity, whether that be economic activity, education, as Amanda said, whether that be B2B, B2C. I think a lot of people's current impressions for right or wrong of the metaverse is we, we go into a virtual space, we walk around with an avatar, we maybe are able to jump, but for the most of the most part, that's about all we're able to do. And then we crowd around something that's represented in 3D. And, and that's very limited, right? It's quite difficult to get excited about that. Like you described about Sandbox or Decentraland early, earlier, the applications that exist in these spaces right now are not that much more sophisticated than either video games or basic video games without the fun part or virtual concerts, which you know are, are not offering that much more if I'm viewing it through the eyes of an avatar. You also have B2B, right? Significant space, the opportunity for businesses, teams to co-create in a virtual space. Now, from an enterprise perspective, that could be two private organizations. From a web th more Web3 centric perspective, that can be about developers working together in a virtual space to create a new product or to create an application or to create a space in which an intrinsically motivated community can come and create value. And that value can be shared with a token. And so together you're creating a collaborative community. The, the, the creator economy, you know, gone wild, augmented through 3D. So the B2B side of the metaverse or the industrial metaverse, I think, is underrepresented or underconsidered at the moment. And so the business value in that five trillion divided by seven years, right? So if it's one trillion a year, however you cut it, um, a lot of that value, I believe, is going to be automation of existing inefficient activity, right? Removal of flights, quicker time for developers to work on stuff together. The example I often use is uh, car, car designers working virtually on a vehicle. Right? They use virtual reality headsets. They're able to work in a shared space. They're able to make edits live. They're able to make changes, view things from different angles, change colors, materials, sounds, etc. And that's a collaboration space. Whether you consider that to be an enterprise application or a metaverse application because it's closed versus open, I think is a worthwhile debate. I think we've also got to make sure we're not just thinking about these as corporate video games. Right? To me, the metaverse has to be more than just going in with an avatar, running around a space, achieving some objectives, collecting some, some coins or whatever else it is and leaving. Because that to me doesn't really move the needle significantly. So a, a few different considerations there, but I think it's important for people just to be taking that as a baseline before we move on and get too excited. Love it. Mo, what are your thoughts on this? Overhyped, get in while you can, start to educate yourself. I think for me, the, the concept of a metaverse personally is is it's not just online, it's in real life as well. And it's, it's a fusion of both. What we saw over COVID is we miss human interaction. We need real life human interaction. So this concept of like we saw in Ready Player One where everyone's plugged into a headset and that is life. 
I hope that's not what the metaverse is. To, to Anthony's point as well, are we just going to be running around and huddling, watching experiences online, or do we still need the, the IRL aspect of that? So for me, it's, it's a fusion of, of both. In terms of what that gives us and, and hype and FOMO, um, so fear of missing out, we've the reason we see that within the space is down to this idea of of rewards and incentives if you come in and buy something you get rewarded and in real life you don't get rewarded you're not paid for going to the gym to exercise you're not paid for paying for playing your computer game you might be from the top two percent if it, on the esports layer or you're an olympian or or, or, a, or an athlete of the highest order but in general you're not paid for these basic things so there needs to be a mindset shift to what motivates people to come into an ecosystem. To the point Anthony was making earlier is that we're actually going to see new business um, use cases born out of fungible tokens, of non-fungible tokens or digital assets. And we're still scratching at the surface of, of what that looks like as of now. I love it. And Amanda, you are an educator yourself. This is your space. You live, you live and you breathe this. I know from uh, my perspective, I'm always saying we need, we need more regulation. I mean, regulation is, I think, key. Mass adoption is key. Uh, and education is key. So regulation, mass adoption, edu education, those are my three sticking points. What are your thoughts? Is this overhyped? Uh, are you telling people get in while you can? Uh, it, separate of the educating yourself? What's your advice? So I was an educator, then I was in and had an agency for 10 years and applied what I learned from education into, with, with brands. And I always said brands are the best teachers in the world. They just need the right curriculum because they have this huge classroom of learners. And I, I believe that, the, that learning is not confined within the four walls of a classroom. Uh, and so I think the future of the metaverse is, which I actually also hate this word, this digital word. I, I really want to rebrand that, but this physical and digital. Um, and I am obsessed with interoperability because I believe that the future of the metaverse is an integrative approach to understanding a person wherever they are within their life of a learner. So whether that is in a metaverse environment or within a classroom, if we could start to have shared language and shared semantics, shared meaning of those behaviors of what it means to learn in the metaverse and what it means to learn in the classroom, I'm hoping the metaverse will change the way that we're thinking about the physical space. And to, you know, what we just talked about in terms of rewards and this pay to play and this pay to earn and the earn to learn, that stuff doesn't work because it, it doesn't work in the real world either. It's a, it's a lower level of engagement and extrinsic motivators are never going to incentivize creativity or never going to incentivize creative thinking. It's going to get someone to a means to an end, but then we have to do more and we have to do more in the physical world too. So I'm never under the situation of like FOMO. I, I try very hard to not do that. So I would say, take your time. This is the beginning. This is like when the internet had a modem and we all remember that AOL sound and the CDs in the mail. Our kids are going to be having a completely new perspective and way of thinking about the entire world. So just take your time, learn, and then approach it in the way that you feel is best for you. And, and just keep learning. Just keep learning and learning and learning, whether it's in the metaverse or in the physical space. And don't do it to just earn, you know, coins to then buy a Gucci hat and Gucci verse or wherever. <laughs> I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much. I love these perspectives. All unique, all valid, all very, very educated. You guys are awesome. Anthony, Amanda, Mo, thank you for, for coming on today. It was a pleasure chatting. Thank you so much, Zen. Have a great rest of your day. That was our Hello Open Metaverse segment brought to you by Animoca Brands. Do check out Anthony Day on LinkedIn at Anthony JJ Day. Check out Amanda Slavin, co-founder at Catalyst Creative and author of The Seventh Level. And definitely check out Mohammed Azeldin, head of tokenomics at animocabrands.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities, we're featuring Sal Buscemi, CEO and co-founding partner of HRN LLC, which is a private multifamily investment office. And he's also the CEO of Danju Partners Capital Management. Impressively, he's the author of several books on investing. His most recent work, Legacy Investing, How the 0.001% Invest, reveals the concerns, 
passions and prejudices of the world's wealthiest families and how that influences their investment decision making. Today, we're chatting generational wealth, leaving a legacy and investing with a purpose. So where do rich people get most of their income from? Well, the top 5% of earners get over two thirds of their income from investments. To build wealth, it's important to invest, stay out of debt and watch your spending. Capital gains matter way more than you realize. Income sources for those making millions of dollars a year are much different from that of the rest of the American population. And according to information taken from the latest tax returns filed with the IRS, salaries and wages make up about half of the income earned for those making $1 million to $1.5 million. However, salaries and wages make up 83% of the total income earned for those making thirty dollars to $40,000. Now, as you might expect, the rich get a larger share of their income from investments than the poor do. In fact, the top 5% of earners get over two-thirds of their income from investment. So the question is, how do you make money like the rich? Well, here to give us insight and depth is the amazing Sal Buscemi. Welcome to the show, superstar. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Zen. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, talk to me. What is the key to wealth? The key to wealth today in American society is investing in businesses. A lot of people have created wealth either through time before or now because we've had this huge explosion in capitalism. We're probably the richest we've ever been since the beginning of humanity, since Genghis Khan. And a lot of people, there's been disproportionate wealth, of course, being moved over to certain parts of income areas that you've talked about before. But it's really the wealthy who have been investing in assets, earlier stage companies, commercial real estate, things that appreciate in value, and even media for that matter. Media is an asset today. Um, we were talking about this earlier. And any, those are the assets that the wealth control is not necessarily just sitting on an oil well today, like it used to be back in the day. A lot of these people have come up with ideas and ideas have gone to market faster because there's been a huge disintermediation and democrat democratization of, um, of people being able to build wealth with their iPhone literally overnight. You said it. You, exactly. People can literally build wealth overnight with their iPhone. And, and it's kind of the, the, you know, the transition into where we're headed now with Web3, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But mm -hmm. overall, becoming a millionaire, it just doesn't happen overnight, right? Only 5%, in fact, attained that feat in less than 10 years. It took the mm -hmm. vast majority of millionaires about 28 years to become one. And the mm -hmm. average age they hit that milestone was statistically about 49 years old. And then when mm -hmm. you look at it a bit further, plus eight out of 10 millionaires did not receive a dime in inheritance. So mm -hmm. that stat mm -hmm. shows even further that you don't have to come from a rich family or make lots of money to become a millionaire to your point. So mm -hmm. let's move on. Let's talk about the ultra wealthy. So for, for the ultra wealthy, uh, rising inflation is in fact playing a big part in how they're going to choose to invest in 2023. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it's as all investors should be. Uh, the ultra wealthy, all, the ultra wealthy are, are concerned about inflation and looking to preserve assets for, for this year, specifically this year. What recommendations do you have to hedge against inflation, especially with a potential recession looming? I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, question you bring up. I think a lot of people today, if you're if you're looking at inflation, that is really a political animal. Right? And inflation is political. It doesn't grow on trees. The wealthy, though, do get wealthier because of inflation. Think about it. The, you know, the apartment building that they own goes up in price because of inflation, because of replacement costs, because of other things like that. So the wealthy have their own sort of, um, you know, insular silo, if you will, of wealth as it, as it allows them to benefit from inflation. The people who really get hurt by inflation are the wage earners and the people who make less than $250,000 a year, because those are the ones right now who are not able, even if they're living within their means, it's very difficult for the American family today to save anything or more or less have any sort of discretionary expenses to do things to invest into. And at that point, the mentality becomes entirely desperate because they start investing into things they probably should not have been investing into because they don't understand it or speculative, you know, and, and great examples of this would have been the meme stocks over the summer that we saw and, and some of that, um, you know, talk and nonsense that was going on. That's mostly the middle class playing those games, and they're doing that because they want to get risk quick, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But as it relates to the ultra-wealthy, the 0.001% of society, 
just about anything they own, own or hold that is um, an asset is indexed to inflation. That could be real estate, that could be gold bars, that could be anything you think of. And that's really sort of making them wealthy when you think about it, because inflation floats all boats, but it, does, it sort of leaves some people behind too. Yeah, well, that's a great point. Great hedges against inflation traditionally happen to be, you know, real estate is one and, bu and building and knowing how to build inflation resistant portfolios is also key for one to your point when you when you talk about real estate, yes. like industrial properties and apartment buildings. Uh, when you think of real estate as an example of an investment to hedge against inflation, this isn't just an asset reserve for the rich. So beyond no. home ownership, real estate investments can be made through, uh, you know, through through real estate investment trusts. These are ERTs that we call them. And I was doing some research, and I, you know, this is this shows all about financial literacy and we trend well in edutainment here. But you know, when you look at a real estate investment trust and you look at it as a whole, it's really it's a company that invests in different kinds of income producing real estate, like shopping centers and condominiums, Correct. housing developments, mm -hmm. hospitals, parking garages. I don't know anything about that, but now you can buy shares of this REIT in order to get exposure to its real estate investments and have that real estate be part of your investment portfolio without actually managing property yourself. So there's one, you know, when you talk about financial literacy and the path to go, let the mm -hmm. experts do their job. I mean, you can invest right. in publicly traded REITs through any brokerage account. It doesn't take a genius. You know, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, Robinhood. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of companies that that allow Almost you for free. <laughs> for free, yeah. And then there's companies yeah. like Fundrise and Yield Street. You know, allow you to buy shares in non-publicly traded REITs on your own through their platform. So it's all about yeah. financial literacy. And also, just to point out, we've been calling it REITs, but the terminology is REIT, right? So these are real estate investment trusts. So for edutainment purposes and for Google purposes, if you're going to be researching this, make sure you are putting in the search bar REIT, REIT, real estate investment trusts. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to pick your brain here. Let's touch on and chat a bit about um, crypto. All right. It's a gray area for a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of people, but despite all the past drama and, and uncertainty this year, and despite all the bad actors like like FTX who tainted the space, I still came out a winner. Uh, Bitcoin is often described as digital gold and the theoretically should protect against inflation because of limited supply. I personally doubled my crypto investments. Um, if you want more control over your crypto and, and you want to own it directly, there's a there's a ton of platforms like Coinbase. Mm -hmm. They offer platforms to sell, swap, store, send over 50 types of crypto. Tell, tell me, are you a crypto fan? What's the bottom line? Is this something scary to you? Would you advise uh, it, against it, it? I am not a crypto guy. Um, and the reason for that is because everything that I operate in with the families that I work with, they don't really understand it. And they understand it as a marketplace where you have a lot of speculators going in, kicking the tires, as we saw. But there weren't really any grown-ups, and the, there wasn't really any sort of centralized sort of SEC around it. And most of the participants were retail mom-and-pop investors. And there were a few institutions, too, who I think were playing along and, and maybe um, capturing some spread or some, you know, some scrape off the top of the less sophisticated investors. I think over time it's going to come into its own. But I also think that it hurt a lot because there were a lot of things that they assumed that they had control or protective mechanisms over as far as their investment, like FTX or something, just weren't there. And now we're in the legal exploratory discovery phase of finding out how all of this is going to shake out. And I think some people got scared of that. The thing with crypto, too, is that um, it is it has a use. It just It's continually evolving. I don't think you can really put the blockchain away and say we're not going to use it anymore. It's always going to be there. But it's going to come out at some point later, or just sort of like the natural progression of a new asset class coming to a market, seeing how the retail mom and pop investors play with it before they make it any sort of um, anything of discernment where the big investment houses start getting into it. And you're going to see that now with JP Morgan getting in. Um, Walmart has a huge crypto stake, too. Um, and, and some emerging companies like El Salvador and Africa, I think those are going to be where if you start to test the, 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 the strength of crypto as a treasury asset, it's going to be in Africa and Latin America. And it might not look good now, but I think over time it's going to look really good and there's going to be some, some benefits of it. But it's just one of those things where you just have to suss it out a little more. You just you just captured a whole audience because, you know, there's a lot of people on this platform. Uh, we speak 
primarily to the top 30th percentile of the income distribution. And I'm going to give a big shout out to Kyle Wool, uh, who's currently serving as non-executive chairman at Revere Securities. He's exactly of that mindset that you just described mm -hmm. when it comes to cryptocurrency. It's not yeah. something that the 0.001% of the ultra wealthy get, understand, or even want to take a bet on. And, and I don't blame them. There's, it's still in its infancy and it lacks regulation. And when you're talking to a group of people that that have pride, pride themselves on regulation to make the money that they've made through sound investments following the rules of the of the law, it feels like a bit of a stretch to tell them to just invest in this big black hole that no one seems to really understand and with, with lack of regulation to your point. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. now let's chat basic habits that the wealthiest self-made millionaires have really incorporated into their financial life. Uh, mm -hmm. We know they avoid debt, they, they buy their cars and plan to keep them long term, they have emergency funds, they invest, they take advantage of everything their employer has to offer if they have an employer, a lot of them mm -hmm. don't, uh, they utilize tax deductions, they look for other income streams, they start mm -hmm. saving for their kids college early on, these are all basic, basic things that we always advocate for. Talk to me uh, about what habits you have learned about in interviewing the wealthiest that seem to be the most prominent in practice. They, you've talked about everything of financial and, and transactional value that an average investor would look at, but the difference between the 1,000th of the 1% and the wage earners that we were talking about earlier is that they put an inordinate amount of investment capital into their network, into traveling, into going to conferences and meeting people so that they can get into these world-class opportunities where they won't have to be forced to go into crypto. I think, not to bring crypto back, but I think when you have 10 years of low interest rates, that sort of forces people to take risks they shouldn't be taking, right? Because low interest rates is a tax on saving. And if you bring it over towards the opportunities that the wealthy get into, like buying a skyscraper or the ultimate, you know, status symbol, owning a part of a sports team um, or a real estate, what have you, is that they all network to be able to get there, to be able to invest with other best in class investors there. And I think you're starting to see sort of like, and, and we've started it and, 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 you know, this has been going on for years, but there's going to be, I think, a reflex back to what we call society-based investing, because societies are basically um, shared values amongst a group of people that could be religious, that could be, um, you know, professional, whatever it is. But I think right now where people are going to start spending a lot, the smart people spend their time networking. I've seen people spend a lot of time come to conferences. I go to conferences a lot. Your network is your net worth. And in my latest book, I talk about one of the families I know. He's second generation. He spends 227 days on the road around the world in 2019. That's how much his network is because that, that influence is more powerful than power. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic that you said that. Um, it's interesting because this is exactly uh, when you look at my life in hindsight, my husband, who's a really successful uh, CEO of Romulus Entertainment, the biggest oh, yeah. uh, in independent film company right here on the East Coast, they've produced uh, Halle Berry's Bruise directorial debut. They did Fences with Denzel Washington. He executive produced on that. Um, we we travel the world on different film sets. We we are with a lot of celebrities. Often we both have very high profile careers and you, you, you hit it right on. It's networking. It's who's mm -hmm. in my phone. My Rolodex is, is probably more valuable. What we call Rolodex old school terms, but my, my, you know, Apple contact list or however where you're storing your, your data these days is the most important thing. And it's actually data sovereignty for the original producer. It's also the need to disrupt yeah. technocracy and to be able to embrace that uh, and capture your, your network and be able to use that to your advantage to not only make money, but also evoke positive change in the world and to of be course. able to really just live on that, leave a legacy to your point. What's the yeah. next thing we all want to do? We want to live a legacy. Well, this is the way to do it. We are out of time. I, I al almost got cut up in an Oprah's book club moment over there, but I love, <laughs> I love everything you're saying. Please come on again. Absolutely. I would love to, Zen. This has been a great time for me. I really hope your listeners appreciate it. Insightful stuff. Well, listen, guys, embracing opportunity to pay off debt, save, invest, and learn all while avoiding potential pitfalls make a big difference on your ability to build your wealth. 
Most self-made millionaires started by reducing their debt to increase cash flow and build their rainy day fund, so to speak. Once these are in place, you'll be able to incorporate the other investment habits and really grow your assets. No matter how simple or obvious a money habit may be, the point is that you stick to it. Discipline is key, and with it, you can build the financial future you desire. That was our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities. Do check out Sal Buscemi directly on their website at investinglegacy.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. We are at the end of our date. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or you could head to 710wor.iheart.com forward slash a moment of zen. Also remember that we're now live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. And we're on YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Of course, all episodes of A Moment of Zen are now available on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV streaming platform. You could head to mox.yourhometv.com. It's all for free. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. Thank you to all of our sponsors that continue to make this segment and the show possible. And remember to join me right here every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 WR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. Remember, happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.